All right, so this is Ruth chapter number four. This is going to be the conclusion of our verse by verse study. As I had already mentioned, hopefully I was able to expound the book of Ruth adequately for you and you're able to grow and expand your knowledge. That's obviously the purpose why we go verse by verse so that you can have a fuller understanding of the book itself, know what it means in context, and then also compare verses within the book itself. We're going to begin reading in verse number one there, chapter four, verse number one. The Bible says, Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsmen of whom Boaz spake came by. Unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Now a quick review from chapter number 3 in the book of Ruth. Remember that Naomi, she as the older woman and the elder of Ruth, her mother-in-law, gave wisdom or gave advice unto her daughter-in-law and told her to go down unto Boaz's threshing floor, wait until after he was done eating and drinking, and then she instructed her to uncover his feet. Everyone has a, a sufficient understanding of what that means now, or that could be weird too. So he, she lay down with him, uncovered his feet, and we saw very clearly that this was a righteous situation that took place. There was nothing you know, inappropriate that happened. They, it was a righteous man and a righteous woman, and she lay down there at his feet humbly, and she actually, in a way, requested or signaled to him that she wanted to marry Boaz. Boaz, of course, accepted, gave her, uh, you know, she had on her, a, uh, her um, uh, um, what do you call it? I just went blank. What do they wear? Veil. I kept thinking vial. Vial, like pouring out a vial or something. No. Totally wrong. She had on her veil, and then he took the veil, and he actually poured in, I believe, six measures of barley. I can't remember exactly, but then she carried that and took it back to her mother-in-law. And if you remember, the uh, chapter 3 actually ended with Naomi telling Ruth that he will not rest until this takes place. Just showing the wisdom that she knows the habits of men. And what do we see in chapter number 4, verse number 1? The next morning, you know, he awakes and he goes down, and that man of whom is next in line to purchase the field and to inherit that inheritance and, and would also be, would be a reliable or required, according to God's law, to raise up seed to the dead and actually marry her. He is next in line, and he, is the, he has now been introduced. And he, it, his name is not given, but they're seated at the gate. And then he calls out to him, and he tells him to come over. He says, Ho, oh, such a one! Uh, turn aside, sit down here, and it says, and he turned aside and sat down. Look at verse number two, now that we're caught up again. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit ye down here, and they sat down. So these men are to be witnesses. Verse number three, and he said unto the kinsmen, so unto that man, his kinsmen, his, his uh, we're going to see here in a minute, his brother. It says, Naomi that is come again out of the country of Moab selleth a parcel of land. Parcel is just like a part. A parcel of land which was our brother Elimelech. Now I want to point out something to you that notice that we're actually given, and I had never noticed this before, but it is our brother Elimelech. Now I did a study just on those two words, our brother, and every single time. I mean, I'm a human, maybe I made a mistake, you both go back and look, but I looked at every single incident, and every time it is a physical brother, like we would refer to a brother, that shares a father over and over and over again. I looked at mostly the brother or a brother, and I'm almost positive that the first like five, ten times every time was a brother. So I'll tell you the relationship of what's going on, and I, I believe I can further prove this, and I never noticed this before uh, uh, until today when I actually looked this up. But I believe that this is his physical and literal brother as we would talk. I believe that they shared a father. And I believe, like it says here, it says our brother Elimelech, I believe that this would actually be um, Ruth's uncle, basically. Uncle-in-law is what this would be relationship-wise to him. Notice he says, our brother Elimelech, right? Now look at verse 4, and I'm going to show you here in just a moment why I further believe that this is you know, a brother as though they share a father. Verse 4, and I thought to advertise thee, saying, buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. He tells them this, if thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. What is he explaining to him there? What is he basically trying to tell him? 
He's telling him that he's interested. You, you tell me whether you're... And why would he do that? Because he obviously doesn't want him to purchase the land. He wants to marry Ruth. He doesn't want him to have the land. He wants... It's not even that the land that he's interested in. We see that, that Boaz is actually interested in Ruth. And he purposefully tells him, if you're going to buy it, go ahead and buy it. He's like, but if not, let me know because I'm after you. But why is he saying that? He's trying to discourage this way, this man, in a way not to purchase the land, of course. Just to let him know I'm interested, right? People would do that in any kind of purchase, right? You, you would tell them, hey, do you want that? Because if you're not interested, I'm interested. Why would you say that? Because you don't want him to buy it. Because you want to get it, right? What, why would some, what's the other reason why someone would say that, right? Now, I want to show you that he's very strategic. He thought this out. If he says here, uh, if thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if, if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. I'm sure Boaz is like, man. But he's got a plan. Notice how he does this. Look at verse number five. Then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess. So notice what he did there. I believe that he was very strategic. I believe that he, that he introduced this in a very specific way, that he had this thought out and planned out. And he first tells him, hey, this land's available. And then, just in case he said, yes, then he waited and he's like, yeah, but the day that you buy that land, why didn't he tell them all at one time? And he told them, hey, the day that you buy that land, you know, you also got to buy it of Ruth. And then notice what he said too, the Moabitess. Notice that? And what is, over and over again, what, what is the view that we can see that the Jews hold of the Moabites? You know, we see, don't let them catch you out of the field, the servants or the maidens, right? They look down upon those of the Moabites and things like that. So notice how he's wording this very strategically because he wants to, uh, he's very discreet, if you will, with his words. He's very selective with the words that he uses because he obviously wants to marry Ruth. It says, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And then verse 6 says this, and the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself. And then he says this, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Now I've looked this up a little bit, but I can't give you a definitive answer of what he's actually saying. There's a couple of ways that this could go. Number one, it could actually have something to do with the fact that he already has a wife and he doesn't want to mar his own inheritance in that sense. Either way, we know that the reason why he said he doesn't want to take the land is because of Ruth. He, he doesn't want to marry Ruth. You saw before he knew that Ruth was involved, he's like, I'll redeem it. But then once Ruth was entered into the equation, he kind of backs out and he's like, I'll mar my own inheritance. Now, he may have just been giving an excuse at this point. He might have just said, well, you know, when he says I mar my own inheritance, that may be a statement that's not necessarily saying, because I don't exactly understand, like I said, of what he means by that. It may not be him just openly coming out, and it may not mean anything about Ruth per se. He might now be just trying to cover up, like, yeah, I just don't want to like, like Brother Rick and I were talking about this. I don't want to like mar my inheritance, like spread out my property. What it could be is if he's already married, maybe because he's raising up seed to his brother, he may have to forfeit the inheritance that he has and then go and take over that inheritance because he's raising up seed to his brother's child at that point. It, the, the child would not be in his own name. He's raising it up in the name of the dead. Therefore, he would just step into that man's place and be there raising up, you know, it would be uh, Malon's child in this case, or Malon's child in this case, is what he would be doing. But either way, we can see that, he's, that he backs out of it. And uh, not only that, it could be, he may not even be married. It might not even be that he's married at all. Uh, most likely, I would say, I would say that he's probably not married, but when, when this is brought up, he's just probably not interested in marrying her. And then once this option is, is given to him, I believe because he would probably have to forfeit his own land, because he says, I would mar my own inheritance. That is referring to me to the actual property or land itself. So I believe he would probably have to forfeit the property or the land that he has and then take over that other property, and he wants to keep that property. It may possibly be that he just doesn't want to marry Ruth, or it may be because he has to marry Ruth that he would have to give up that property as well. He couldn't own both properties because he's raising up seed in the, in the name of his brother, uh, or actually, of, in that case, of his son-in-law. So he says there at the end of verse 6, for I cannot, no, I'm sorry, let's read verse 6. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. So we'll read the full verse. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. And that's what Boaz wanted in the first place. 
Now, uh, right here, verse 7, I want to focus on this for a minute. Now, this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. So this is a transaction that's taking place, like a business transaction. Concerning changing for to confirm all things. So this is going to be the confirmation of this business transaction that's taking place. This is the sign. A man plucked off his shoe. When it says plucked off, it means he just took his shoe off. Plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Now there's a specific reason why they were to do this. This is again a reference to the law. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter number 25, verse number 5. Deuteronomy chapter number 25, verse number 5. <clears throat> chapter number 25, verse number 5, the Bible says, If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of of an husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which, shall be, which she beareth shall succeed, succeed in the name of his brother which is dead. That is his name, that, that his name be not put out of Israel. Verse 7, And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel, he will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. So we see this exact scenario actually being played out in the book of Ruth, in Ruth chapter 4, where the man refused to marry her, correct? Well, look at verse 8. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it, saying if he admits to it and he stands by this, that this is his decision, he stands, he, and if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, verse 9. Then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his, his shoe loose. Now if you notice here, there was a little, it's a little bit different than what played out at the end of the book of Ruth. Number one, let me point out this. You'll notice... One thing as well is that a lot of people are still doing the commandments and they're keeping the commandments. I'll tell you why I believe that. Number one is because they are under the judges. That is God's perfect law. And if they were to stay under the judges, they were more likely to keep following God's law because that was the system he, he actually designed. That's going to be more effective than when, when they have a king, right? Number one. Number two, you'll notice that they're keeping this law, but they're not following it to a T. Notice the difference as well. What part is missing in Ruth chapter 4? The woman didn't take off his shoe. Exactly. Two things. You're exactly right. The woman didn't take off his shoe, number one, and the woman didn't spit in his face. So notice that over time, this law had kind of been changed or phased out. And in what way? What did it take out? The embarrassing things for the man. Do you see how they started altering God's law a little bit? What's the embarrassing part? Number one, that, they, that she spits in his face. That's meant to be a shaming, a, a shameful thing. Yeah. That's meant to, he's supposed to go and be ashamed. And, all, and you know, what happened was slowly over, over time, they just become softer and weaker. Things degrade. Hum, we're men, we're humans, right? Mankind is sinful. And over time, things are going to slowly change. We're going to slowly get away. Every culture, it doesn't matter who it is. Even if they start off righteous, they get worse and worse over time. It doesn't matter who it is. So we, and we see that happening even with them, that they're following God's law less and less. And even the commandments that they're keeping, they're not keeping to a T, are they? Not only is it shameful for, for a woman to spit in your face, but it's also shameful that she's the one that takes your shoe off. Notice that she wasn't actually the one that took off the shoe. Someone else did. She's not even present, right? So, and they didn't actually go before the priests or the judges in this case. They just did it before the elders as well. So there's a few differences that take place in this scenario. Now, if you look close, you'll notice that the people that are actually involved are real brothers. You notice that? They are, they are real brothers. Another reason why I believe that this is actually a brother. And if you say, well, this is not a brother of Malon and, and Kilion, you're right, it's not. But you'll notice at the end of the book of Ruth, we're going to read this in a minute, this is spoken of as this being a child of Naomi. Because even though there are no, there are no brothers left of, of Malon and Kilion, they're gone. 
The next one would be for Naomi's brothers. That's the next location to where you were, you know, brothers-in-law, of course. That's the next location where you were to go. And that's what we see exactly here is an actual brother. So I believe, and, and just from studying our brother and studying the law, and you even see examples played out where the men who were the Sadducees who go to, and they don't believe in the resurrection, they go to Jesus, and what example do they use? They use liberal brothers, don't they? They say, if there's seven brothers... And one get married, and then he dies, and another brother gets married, and then he dies, and another brother. And what are they? They share a father. They're actual brothers. So I believe that this is her, however, whether this is strange to you or not, I believe that this is her, technically her uncle-in-law is who this would be, which would also explain why he's an older man. That makes much more sense when you see him make the statement previously that it says that thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich, he says in Ruth chapter number two. So what does that imply when he says, when she's interested in him, we're following after him, and then he tells her, thou followest not young men, that he's not a younger man, right? He would be an older man. And then we see this being, he says, our brother to this guy. So this is, I believe, his brother. That makes perfect sense when we study it out. So uh, keep looking there. Uh, let's, uh, let's continue to read in Ruth chapter number four. It says in um, verse number nine, and Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Milon's of the hand of Naomi. So he bought all of that, all of that land now. He has the witnesses and everything, and it has been confirmed. So this transaction is complete. He officially owns this property and has now uh, you know, uh, also purchased Ruth. Look at verse number 10. It says, Moreover, Ruth, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. That the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. So over and over again, we see that, as in this example, we can see Boaz being a righteous man. What's he doing? He's following God's law. Not only is he following God's law as though he is keeping the law itself, but he's following it again to the T, like every area, every section of it. He's taking it even to the extreme of, not, not the extreme, to the point of that a lot of people avoid it, which is raising up in the name of the dead, right? What was the reason why in the famous example of Onan, when he spills it on the ground, what was the purpose why he did that? It was because he did not want to raise up seed to the dead. It says because he knew that it would not be under his name. He knew that child would not be his name. Here, what do we see? We see Boaz actually prepared to marry Ruth, to have a child with Ruth. But not only that, he's going to name this child after it's Milan is who it is. That's actually who Ruth was married to. Because it tells you right there... <clears throat> Uh, the wife of Milan have I purchased to be my wife. So it would be Milan's son, is what we would see here in verse number 10. And he's fine with that. You know what else that tells me? He, that he's a humble man. That he, he's not so worried about, oh, I just got to make sure that my seed remains in this earth. I got to make sure that it's my name and my reputation and I'm passing it off and I got another Boaz running around here. He's not concerned about that. You know what he's more concerned about? Keeping God's law. He's concerned about being a righteous man. Like we see over and over and over again here in the book of Ruth, we see Boaz and Ruth both being righteous. Look at, uh, let's continue reading there. So he says, have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren. And then it says, and from the gate of his place, ye are witnesses this day. <clears throat> Verse 11, and all the people that were in the gate and elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. Now I want to focus on something real quick, just so you know. I feel like there's a lot of nuggets in the book of Ruth that help you study if you cross-reference. You know, thanks. It helps you study a lot of other sections in the Bible. You know, we've understood from the book of Ruth what it means to cover your feet. We've understood a, the clearest definition of what corn is in the Bible from the book of Ruth. Another thing is this. Uh, notice right there the very last statement. Uh, the last two statements, actually, the two clauses where it says, And do thou worthily, we're in the end of verse Ruth, or uh, verse 11, Ruth 4, verse 11, 
and do thou worthily in Ephratah and be famous in Bethlehem. Now, if you'll notice there and you're familiar with the Bible system of language, where would you say Ephratah is? Bethlehem, exactly right. Now I want you to turn over to Genesis chapter number 35, verse number 19. Brother Rick actually asked me about this the other night because there are people that are mentioned in the Bible called Ephrathites, right? Um, it is said that David was born of an Ephrathite. And, and, uh, and David was born of Jesse, of course, and where was Jesse from? It says Bethlehem, Judah is what it says. That's another way of saying Bethlehem because Bethlehem is located in the region of Judah. And uh, so just from this verse itself, you can see where Bethlehem is. He's just repeating the same thing, right? Well, if we do a cross-reference here back to Genesis chapter number 35, verse number 19, we get a clearer answer. <clears throat> chapter number 35, verse number 19, it says, And Rachel died and was buried in the way to, e uh, to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. So there's a very clear definition of what Ephrath is. It is Bethlehem. I want you to look at 48.7. Chapter number 48, verse number 7. Here's another very clear, even more clear, actually, definition of what or where Ephrath is. Chapter 48, verse number 7. 48, verse 7 says, And as for me, when I came from Padan... Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath. And I buried her there in the way of Ephrath. And then he says this, the same is Bethlehem. So there you have two definitions of where Ephrath is, and it's Bethlehem. This is why in Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2, the famous verse about Jesus Christ being born, you know, it says, And thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though thou be limbless among the nations, you know, he says, yet out of thee, I've never memorized it, but yet out of thee shall he come forth which shall be ruler in Israel. I believe it says ruler in the Old Testament and then governor in Matthew 2. Ruler of Israel, and it says, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. So it says Bethlehem, Ephrathah, and then Matthew chapter 2, I think it's verse 9. In Matthew chapter 2, it leaves off Ephrathah, or Ephrath. It says, and let me tell you this too, I've studied so sometimes it's called Ephrata, and sometimes it's called Ephrath. It's the same thing. I've looked it up. Right here we have an example of him calling Ephrata Bethlehem, and then we see it actually being called, I believe, uh, Ephrata in Ruth 4, and then Ephrath where we saw in Genesis. And then it says in Micah 5, 2, it actually says, and thou Bethlehem, I believe, Ephrata. This is very common. Languages change slowly over time. It's kind of like Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar, right? Languages will just slowly change over time, and, and names will change. It's like, uh, you know, the exam here's a perfect example. You know, uh, what is uh, the tribe that Jesus was born of called in the Old Testament? Judah, right? What is it called in the New Testament? Judas. It's called Judas. That is the name that is primarily you know, used in the New Testament. If you look in like Matthew 1, it's Judas. It would, the, the reason why, there's, there are, you know, people just that, that, that never maybe study languages, they think that, that there's just these random changes, but they actually, there are strategic changes. Normally, you know, E's kind of change to I's because language works in a certain way. So whether we understand it or not, we kind of pronounce things just slightly different and they go back and forth. E's will change to I's. Um, the reason why the S, if you look at a lot of the, uh, of, the, of the names, like Hezekiah of the Old Testament, do you know what it is in the New Testament there in Matthew 1? Hezekiah. So notice the similarity. What did the H change to? An S. What does the H change to in the name Judah? An S. It's the same thing. So H's kind of just start to change to S's is what happens. When you translate from Greek to English, when you translate from Hebrew to English. It's just kind of how languages work. They'll have patterns. There are patterns. I didn't mean strategic earlier, but there are patterns. Whether we, we you know, we're not doing it purposely, but we'll just pronounce things. There are, there are sounds that are very similar to one another, and they'll make slight changes. So Ephrata is the same as Ephrath, and it actually is referring to Bethlehem, and it used to be the name of Bethlehem is what it is. Notice at that time that that name is actually what it's called, primarily in the, in, uh, the time of uh, uh, you know, Abraham, right? He says, he'll say, Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. So Moses is then telling you it's Bethlehem. You understand what I'm saying? Because that, now that is the name. But then once you get into, after Moses, when they founded the land, they're living in the land, and years go by, what does he say? It'll say, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. So notice they changed orders. 
That's because now it's primarily being called Bethlehem. So that's what, so if you see like uh, someone called an Ephrathite, another one is Elkanah, Hana's husband. He's called an Ephrathite. Where is he from? He's from Bethlehem, Judah. That's the area that he's from. So this, this area is referring to Bethlehem. And you could have just learned that from, you know what this does is this strengthens the, the understanding of the method that the Bible uses of repeating things. You understand what I'm saying? Because then we can look somewhere else where it actually tells you, it just plainly just says, Bethlehem, the same as Ephrata. Or it says it backwards. Ephrata, the same as Bethlehem. And it says, Ephrata, which is Bethlehem. So we know for a fact, Ephrata is Bethlehem. Then what do we see here? We see a pattern where he says, at the end of verse 11, and do thou worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. So this is just a, you know, a bolster or confirmation of, of the method of how the Bible repeats itself, but it just repeats it in just a slightly different way. And you say, why would the Bible do that? To help you grow in wisdom, to help you grow in knowledge. So you don't have a limited vocabulary. You understand what I'm saying? So you, what you do is there's slightly different names or slightly different words, and they mean they overlap, but they have these, these small, on the edges, they have just small different understandings that you can learn. Things that you can grow from one thing, things that you can grow, that you can't grow from learning the other, right? So that's why God will repeat things like that. Look at verse 12. We'll continue reading. And let thy house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. Verse 13. So Bo Boaz took Wo uh, Ruth, and she was his wife, and went in, un and he went in unto her. The, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. Also, I want to point out something else. I'm going to read this again. Does this sound like the first time or the second time? Listen to this. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and, and when he went in unto her, right? That is a euphemism of them having a relationship. Does that sound like that's the first time, or maybe they've done this before? It's, it's clear, right? And when he had went in under her, she conceived. Do you understand what I'm saying? Further backing up, they did not have relations prior to this. That was not going on in, in Ruth chapter number three. The, and and this, this also debunks, and you can use this. There's this weird view. You know, um, everybody thinks I'm a Ruckmanite. I am not. But Peter Ruckman, this is a very, he's got a lot of weird teachings. I think the guy saved, of course, as everyone here knows. Now everyone on YouTube knows, too. You know, uh, maybe I'll have to make a video about that. But here, I, uh, you know, he's got a lot of weird teachings, too. And one of them is that, that marriage takes place. And there are a lot of people that actually believe this. <clears throat> and I think this is very weird. It's very contrary to what the Bible teaches. Uh, one of them is that marriage is just when you, you know, commit that act. So you just basically, that's when marriage takes place. That's when you become man and wife. Not just that it's consummated, but like if you do that with anyone. It's like, then number one, there's like no such thing as fornication then. Number one. Then she just becomes wife. So that's number one, why that doesn't make sense. Number two, notice what it says here. This is a, a perfect example to debunk that. And she was his wife. And when, and when he went under her, went in under her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. What's the order of events here? Wife, and then he goes in under her. Not only that, this is the one that caught my eye when I was, when I was reading and trying to debunk it. Because I knew that that wasn't right. I subconsciously maybe understood that. It just maybe it didn't just feel right in my heart. Matthew chapter number one with Joseph. What is it? What is it? Do, you know what, do you guys remember what it actually calls Mary before they when she's already referred to as his wife in Matthew chapter number one at the time that the angel comes to uh, Joseph in a dream. He, you know, he says, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember the exact word that's used, but his spouse. His spouse. Well, yeah, he's his spouse. No, I couldn't. There's a word that, that along the lines of like, fear not. I think he says fear. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. That's the phrase I was looking for. I, I couldn't remember it said fear. That was the word I was looking for. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Because that, you know, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So had they had relations yet? No, it actually tells you the next verse. And he knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son. Right? So she's still his wife. She's already his wife. You understand what I'm saying? She's referred to as his wife, but he knew her not. This is an example where, you know, he, uh, sh this is a woman that is his wife first. And then it tells you, he goes, so that's a weird teaching. That's not, that's not biblical. It can clearly, clearly be debunked from more places than what we've mentioned already. So uh, continue reading there, uh, verse number 14. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, 
that his name may be famous in Israel. So notice this goes for Naomi, right? That's why I was mentioning why I believe that this is Naomi's brother-in-law. That was his brother-in-law prior because she was married to Elimelech. And then Elimelech's brother is that kinsman that was mentioned. And then Boaz, of course, which would be, you know, I keep saying this, it probably sounds weird, her uncle-in-law. But now it's her husband, so... Probably from North Carolina, right? <laughs> yeah, so look there in uh, verse number 14. Again, so it says, I want to point out something else. And the women said unto Naomi, watch this. Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. Verse 15, I want to read these in tandem together. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons. Hath borne him. Now notice when it says that she that uh, he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and he says, and a nourisher of thine old age. What is it saying? It's gonna make you cheerful. Children are a good thing. Children are a blessing. Amen. Look at what it says in verse number eleven. I believe it was verse eleven. And all the people that are in the gate, and the elders said, We are witnesses, the Lord make the woman that is coming to thy house like Rachel and like Leah. Notice this is just the consensus among everyone. Like Rachel and like Leah, which two, watch this, did build the house of Israel. What, is it, what, is, what are all these people saying? I hope you're able to have how many kids? They had 13 kids. Dinah included. They had 12, and then they had a daughter, right? 12 tribes, the 12 sons. What are they, what are they blessing them? A lot of people would think like today, they'd be like, don't curse me with that. But at this time, just everyone's like, I hope you're able to build a house. I hope you're able to build a tribe is what they're talking about, a whole family. Start, you know, the, a whole nation. Because having children are a good thing. Amen. Having children are a blessing. What happens as soon as Naomi has that baby? If she's happy. What does it talk about after a woman give, you know, uh, gives birth? In uh, John chapter seven or John chapter 18, I believe. It says, or 16, John 16. It says that, that there's joy afterwards, that a man child is born into the world. Children are a blessing. People look at children today like they're a curse from God. You know why? Because they're selfish. That's why. They're selfish. And what do they they, they they look at the child like it's a burden. They look at the child like he's like it's just cumbersome to bring him them along with them. And there's so many things that I can't do. And then I have to forsake my dreams and I have to do this. Because they're selfish. Because they don't care about anybody but themselves. That's really, really what the reason is. You start asking people, why don't you have any kids? Well, I just want to, you know, I want to make sure that I can finish my, you know, uh, schooling first. And I can, and a lot of eyes in there. And I want to, you know, make sure that I can start my career. And I just want to make sure that, no. God opens the womb and God closes the womb. And if you're married, you need to have children. Period. Because it's a blessing to have kids. And you should not be using any sort of contraceptive because it is a blessing to have children. You're blessed if your womb is open, right. women. You're blessed if you can have kids. It, you know what? When, when uh, God tells Adam that he's able to have children, that he's going to have children, it says that he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. It's a blessing to have children. The Bible talks about, you know, in uh, the book of Psalms, how, how, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man. Arrows, multiple. So are children of the youth. Talks about having his table full of them. You know, you need to go buy a big table and have a lot of kids. <laughs> kids are a blessing. Kids Amen. are not a burden. You know, and, and the only way that we get that type of attitude is if you're selfish. The only way that you're going to view that is if you're a self-centered, you know, just, just narcissistic type person. And that's what our society has created today. They've, you know, strategically tried to destroy the home. And, and what's happened over the past, like, 60, 70, 80 years in our nation, people have just become just to where they are just like these just self-absorbed narcissists. Everyone is. And if you ask somebody, why don't you have kids, what's the reason that they give you? It's got something to do with themselves, right? It's always. It's never, it's never like some, like, selfless reason. Like, oh, and then it's something to do with the child or anything like that. It's, you know, it's always some selfish reason because that's the only reason why someone doesn't have kids. And, and you say, how many kids you can have? I'm going to have as many as God gives me because he opens the womb and he closes the womb. And if my wife is able to bear, then that means God has left her womb open for right. me to have children. Right. So I'm going to have as many kids as I possibly can. And there's one coming right now. Add to the, to the tribe. We're going to make the house of Israel. <laughs> Look at uh, verse... Uh, Look at verse, where, where do we leave off? 15? 
Yeah, look at verse 16 now. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. Verse 17, and the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Verse 18, <clears throat> now these are the generations of Perez. Perez begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Amminadab, and Amminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and, Bo and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. I was going to call Brother Russell out, but he, he pronounced it correctly. Most people, they, this is not like the fish, salmon, this name. It's, it's pronounced Solomon. That's how you pronounce that name. Almost everybody pronounces this wrong because they're so worried that they're going to, you know, because salmon is kind of an exception, the way that the pronunciation is of that particular word. So everybody, I think, is like really like sensitized to making sure they pronounce that right. Every time I, I think I've ever heard anybody read the Bible out loud, and I was ready. I was listening to Brother Russell, and I was going to point it out right now, but he got it right. It's Salmon is how it's pronounced, Salmon. So notice, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Bo get, Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. You know what you get now is you get, really, the primary purpose of this book. Because you say, what is going on in this book? You know, why are we reading about, doesn't it seem very, very, you know, as an anomaly of the Bible? I mean, it's just like a love story just like smack right in the middle. And, and just the course of events that are recorded, the way that it takes place, what's recorded, it, it seems like, a, a, you know, like a, a diversion from most of what's in the Bible. But do you know why? It's because it's all about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. Every book in the Bible is about Jesus. Jesus. It says that when Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus, when he was walking with Cleopas and the other anonymous person, it says while he was walking that he, that he taught, to, taught them of himself out of every book of the Bible. Everything in the Old Testament. Every book is about. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. I want to point out one, two last things real quick here at the very end. Now, what was, uh, what was Boaz going to do? Boaz was going to have a child with Ruth, right? He was going to have a child with Ruth, and he was going to raise up seed to who? Malon, right? Malon, exactly right. I want you to look here in Matthew chapter number 1. What you have here is you have the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it was all pointing to. The whole Testament is pointing to the New Testament, the New Covenant, and it's pointing to the coming of the Messiah. The Bible begins with, in the very beginning, the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ coming when the promise is given of the Messiah to Eve. He would, come to, he would someday come and defeat death and hell, right? He would defeat Satan. And from that point forward, we're just pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ that makes perfect sense. And I believe the books of the Bible are in the perfect order. Makes perfect sense. You flip over to you know, Matthew chapter number one, and what do you see? The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The son of David, the son of Abraham. The book of Matthew, they all have themes, the, the, all the gospels. And the book of Matthew has the theme of the king of the Jews. It is a very Jewish book, if you will. It quotes the Old Testament more than any of the other books, right? That's why you see his genealogy in the very beginning, and it is his genealogy going back to Abraham, and it stops at Abraham, right? Abraham was he who technically founded, in a way, the nation of Israel. It started with Abraham, and then, of course, Isaac, and then Jacob. Abraham was where that covenant was reestablished that was also given to Noah. It was reestablished, and then of him he made that nation, which would become who? Israel would become the Jews, right? Well, notice what it says here as well. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The book really is about him being the king of the Jews. And what do you have there in verse number one? The son of David, what is that? The king, the son of Abraham, what is that? The founder of the Jews, right? You read here and it tells you Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat Judas. There you see that Judah and Judas and his brethren and Judah begat Perez. And, Z and Zara of Tamar, and it's Tamar in the Old Testament, Th Tamar in the New Testament. And Pharaoh begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram, and Aram begat Amminadab, and Amminadab begat Naasen, and Naasen begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Booz. Now that's Boaz right there, of Rechab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. What's very interesting, are, I believe there's only two women that are mentioned in the genealogy here. And it's very interesting that one of them is Ruth, number one. 
and she is a Moabite. She is not even of, uh, originally of the descent of Abraham himself. Notice how God, you know, you know, all of these, like I said, Zionists, there's been a lot, this has been a hot topic throughout the four chapters because it's just coming up a lot, right? Because, why? Because the whole theme of the book is Ruth marrying in to a Jew, Ruth marrying into Israel, to the Jews, right? And God doesn't care at all. He mentions in his own line, hey, he wants to make sure you know. And Ruth puts it right there smack in the middle. Ruth was one of them. You know what else that tells me is this, that Ruth was a great woman of God. You can see that. And, what, and notice, there's only two books in your whole Bible that are named after women. What is it? Ruth and Esther. Why? Because Ruth was a great woman. She was a great woman. She was a, she was a super hard worker. I personally, after looking at this more recently, I believe that Proverbs chapter 31, when it's talking about the virtuous woman, I believe, because Scripture is always based on Scripture, something I've noticed more and more when I, when I read the Bible, even things that when they're preaching in the New Testament, you can find that preached somewhere else almost all the time. I believe that when that prophecy was being preached of a virtuous woman, that it was talking about Ruth specifically. There are many, many reasons that I think about that more and more. Why? Because it talks about the elders sitting in the gates of the city. What do you have Boaz doing? Sitting in the gates, right? The elders sitting in the gates of the city. Not only that, she says, you know, in the book of Ruth, it mentions uh, that uh, when Naomi had, had born him, had birthed him, I'm sorry, when Ruth had birthed him and it's given to Naomi, it says, it says that she is, Ruth is better to thee than seven sons. You notice the value that's put on, like, a, a Ruth. And what does it say about the virtuous woman? It says she's, she's far above, her price is far above a ruby. So you see it, them talking about, you know, the greatness of her. It's talking about how Ruth is just a great woman. And what is the greatest characteristic of Ruth in the book of Ruth? Being a hard worker. What is the greatest characteristic of the virtuous woman? The whole thing is about her doing what? Working. You know, the only person called a virtuous woman in the Bible by name is Ruth. That's a lot of coincidences, if you will. I believe, and you know what's even more interesting is, the, the person who penned the book of Proverbs down, he and then a couple other people after him were all in the line, and it is, it is primarily ascribed to who? To Solomon. So that would have been his great-great-grandmother. You understand what I'm saying? You see how these things would have been perfectly related for that actually to have her in mind when speaking of the virtuous woman. You get to the New Testament, he, her name gets to be in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only that, remember what I said right when we turned to Matthew chapter number one, whose name should be in the genealogy? Malon. You know what you see? Boaz. God chose to reward Boaz with putting Boaz's name there. When it should be Malon. But God did not do that, did he? Now, Boaz was going to do that which is right. Boaz was going to to, he wanted to raise up seed to the dead. And you know what? I bet that child, when he was named, that he was known as Malon's child. And then what do you see? God rewards Boaz for being a righteous man. And what does he get? Gets to have his name there in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. When it really should have been, technically, Malon's name. But I'm sure, like I said, Boaz had no problem with it. Did he? You go back to Ruth chapter number 4. Boaz had no problem with, he wanted to. He wanted to be righteous. He was going to make sure that he followed every, he was going to dot every I, cross every T, right? When we were, we were talking about, you know, how, you know he, he abstained from fornication. He wanted, to make, he wanted to marry Ruth, but he was first going to go to the closer kinsman. He wanted to follow the law to every T, didn't he? And not only that, he was going to have a child with Ruth, who he, who he obviously loved, and praises her as a virtuous woman, and he had no problem with raising up that child as though it was Malon's son. Think about that. But then when you get to Matthew chapter number one, when God decides to record the genealogy, he's rewarded. Boaz is then rewarded later on by God putting his name there. And what a, you know, what a, you know, a reward. I mean, being in the line, I mean, think about that. Being in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ you wonder why it's such a big deal with Esau giving up his birthright and him being spoken of in the book of Hebrews? You know what birthright he gave up was when you read there in the, in the book of Matthew, that could have said Esau instead of Jacob. That could have been Esau that had that blessing and had that birthright instead of his brother Jacob. Isaac could have blessed Esau, 
but because he despised his birthright, because he, he, it didn't mean anything to him. It wasn't that important to him. He wasn't worried about the blessings of God. He knew that that birthright and the blessings were of God, but he wasn't concerned with it. And what did he, he got left out? What do you see Boaz being a righteous man? He cares of those things. He cares so much that he doesn't even mind whether his name actually gets written there in Matthew chapter number one. And what does he get? He actually gets rewarded in the end. So you do, this is, this is the, the point. You do that which is right. You do what you're supposed to do. You have the right heart. And then sometimes, even when you don't expect to get a reward, God will reward you for it anyways. You know why? Because he's a righteous God. He's a righteous God. And you look over there, and his name got to be in. I think about that a lot. Like, how incredible that is that, you know, if, if you were of the physical flesh, you were one of the progenitors of the line of which the creator of the world decided to be born of. I mean, that's amazing. I don't know if you really, like, comprehend that in your mind. I'm sure I don't even to the fullest extent. But that's amazing. That's deep. That God chose of your son one day. That he was going to be, you know, he was going to be born of your daughter, if, if you will. He would miraculously conceive a baby. I mean, that's amazing. And Boaz was rewarded with that. Why? Because we saw that he was a righteous man. He was rewarded of his name being there because he was a righteous man. That concludes, you know, the book of Ruth. And the point is this. <coughs> Great things about the book of Ruth. We saw chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. It's just a, you know, it's just a packed book with doctrine. We, there's so many different angles. It's a very interesting story. There's a lot of drama involved. It's very different. But what's the whole point of the book? This is what I want to end on. What's the whole point of the book? What does it end you with? David. Why is David important? What's the only reason why he's important? Jesus Christ is coming of his line one day. Amen. That's the whole point of that book. So this, it doesn't matter what book we study. It doesn't matter what book I choose next. Minor prophets, major prophets, historical, poetry, New Testament, epistles. It doesn't matter. You know what that book is ultimately going to be about? The Lord Jesus Christ. When you Amen. read the Bible, study it looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's one true God. And that one true God has chosen, and so many people miss out on this by not understanding the true nature of God. He has chosen that he will forever be known and forever be glorified through the man Christ Jesus, through the Messiah, the anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So when you read your Bible, every page, every verse, every, everything in the Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind when you study your Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, uh, for being our Savior. We thank you, dear Lord, just how you, you come down and you work in matters with man, how that, you, uh, that you've inspired this book for us, dear Lord God. You've given us so many different examples. You use human beings all throughout time to pin it down, to, to come up the line of Ruth and Boaz. We thank you for the examples of Ruth and Boaz, dear Lord. Of, uh, of just showing us, dear God, what a righteous man and a righteous woman, how a relationship should take place. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we just love you. We ask that you would be with us and bless us and uh, help me to have the, the wisdom to choose the next book properly. Dear Lord, and just be with us. Help our church to grow. Uh, add church members unto uh, our congregation here, dear Lord. Help us to grow, as I said, and help us to be a church and a refuge for those in the area where they can come and they can learn the Bible, those that want to learn the Bible. We love you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.